Uh, to introduce ourselves, I'm Steve Smith. I'm the Chief Executive of Action on Armed Violence, uh, which is a, uh, a UK-based uh, international NGO, but with projects currently spanning four countries internationally. Um, I'm joined by St Steve Goose, the Arms Director from, um, or Director of the Arms Division from Human Rights Watch. On my right is Ian Overton, Action on Armed Violence's relatively new Director of Policy and Investigations. And over on the far left, I've got Serena Alziati, who is, again, from Action on Armed Violence, and she's our senior policy advisor. Uh, what we plan to do today is um, it, I'll go through our explosive violence report that um, shows the level of explosive violence harm through 2012. Um, I'll hand over to Ian. Uh, I'll just do the introduction for that. Ian will go through some of the, uh, the key statistics that the report brings out. We'll then hand over to, to Steve Goose, who will talk about um, a specific area of harm, and that's specifically air-launched weapons and their effect in Syria. And uh, Serena will finish off with the importance of, of casualty reporting and monitoring, um, which is obviously key to, to what we're trying to put across here. So as for the report itself, um, it covers explosive weapons. It's not small arms and light weapons. It's not bladed weapons. It's not knife crime. Um, and it's statistics that we have gathered, gathered throughout 2012. Um, I'm going to start with a quote. We should stop the shelling. For me, explosions lead to destruction. And more than that, the shelling makes people get injured and it makes people die. The only effect is destruction, death and wounded people. My home has been destroyed we were in it when it was hit and when it fell. I feel as though all of Syria has been destroyed. And that was, uh, that was a quote taken from uh, a 13-year-old displaced Syrian boy. Um, his first name's um, Saja, and he's quoted in, in our report. So what about the report? Well, we've, this is the second year that we've done it. Um, and in 2011, we found the most horrifying statistics. These clearly showed that civilians were being killed and injured to a far greater degree than the military combatants uh, by explosive weapons. Um, some of the statistics we found out in 2011 that were that when there are grenade attacks, eight out of 10 casualties are civilians. When there are mortar attacks, nine out of 10. And we found that IED attacks uh, caused 61% of civilian casualties uh, across all of explosive weapon incidents. So that was pretty appalling. Um, we wanted to see clearly how that compared to 2012. Um, if 2011 was bad enough, 2012 was absolutely appalling. Um, some headline statistics. All of them were up. In 2011, just over 30,000 casualties killed and injured from explosive weapons from just over 2,500 incidents. In 2012, that had risen by, uh, by nearly 5,000 casualties to... 35,000 or just approaching 35,000 across 2,742 incidents. This happened across 58 countries worldwide. In 2011, civilians made up 71% of the overall casualties. We thought that was bad enough. Going to 2012, that was 78%. More than three quarters of the casualties were civilians to explosive violence. So where was this happening? Uh, we've got the top 15 here. Syria, of, co of course, has tipped the balance to some extent. Uh, it's crept up right to the top of the list there, displacing Iraq. Um, and uh, there are probably no great surprises as, as you look down the list where explosive violence is happening across the world. But what do I mean when I say that we recorded? Uh, and I have to be quite specific about this. We used over 580 English language sources for our data, English language media sources. That doesn't mean that we used English newspapers or English and American newspapers. This means that usually and where possible in the countries concerned, we resorted to the English language media there. <coughs> we were quite specific about the data we were insistent on picking up. We had to have the date, the time, the location, the number and circumstances of the casualties, the weapon types, uh, the reported user, if possible, the target, the detonation method, and again, where possible, the recorded damage. Um, at least one casualty had to be reported for us to, to record this. 
we excluded incidents where there was no clear date, no clear, um, no, no clear location, and no clear casualty numbers. Um, so what I mean by that is that where we got, um, and you'll often see this in media sources, there were 50 casualties to offensive, uh, to offensive uh, operations over the last week in, say, Syria, random example. That's not of great use to us because is it 50? Is it more? Is it less? Was it to explosive violence? Was it to small arms and light weapons? You don't really know. So we had to be really rather more specific than that. We cross-check our data. Over 87% of the, the reports that we had could be cross-checked. Um, we don't therefore claim, though, to have a 100% accuracy on all casualties to explosive violence. What I'm saying is, if anything, we're under-reporting. These truly horrific statistics are very much under-reporting. This is the least worst case. We're showing trends, we're showing patterns, we're showing color. The actual situation on the ground is undoubtedly much, much worse. And so to go into that a little bit more and to look at some more detail on our statistics, I'll hand over to Ian Overton now. Yeah. Thank you. I'm, I'm obviously faced with the rather difficult task of um, trying to marry the fact that you're having your lunch with explaining mass death and destruction around the world. Um, so I apologize if I put you off your, off, off your sandwiches. But um, the overview, unfortunately, is, is pretty grim. Um, compared to 2011 to 2012, in terms of civilians killed and injured, we pretty much see uh, a 26% rise. It, it's, and that's the least worst case. Obviously, Syria had a major impact on that. But uh, rising violence in um, other areas, Nigeria, also contributed. Um, so we're looking at overall 78% um, of civilian casualties across the board in terms of explosive weapons. Um, which, um, when, you, when you look at that, that sort of detail and you raise from a, a total civilian of the year before of 27,000 to 35,000, um, it's not just Syria that's really pushed that up, it's other conflicts as well. Um, and that 78% doesn't break down into specifics, as we'll show. Um, it's also worldwide. 58 countries are involved in explosive violence, quite surprising. Some, obviously, places like Canada and Australia, maybe just one case. But um, as you can see from this image, um, the black dots in the center are real hearts of darkness um, when it comes to explosive weaponry. Um, and there's a huge impact on civilians. I think this is very much a, a theme that AOAV particularly is going to be pursuing over the next um, year or so, is the, the massive impact that civilian casualties uh, incur when, when um, uh, an explosive weapon is used in an urban area. And it, when you look into that, is places like marketplaces, urban residential areas, and places of worship that um, clearly there's a real problem. And, and a, a suicide bomb or an IED in a marketplace, average civilian casualty is 25. Uh, in place of worship, it's 23. So um, there's, a, there's a real issue of, of targeted um, IEDs and explosive weapons in urban areas. The car bombs clearly come on top when, it, when it's about looking at the maximum impact. Unfortunately, this, this very slide could be used by um, people who want to spread terror um, as a kind of a focal point because um, it, it is a, a kind of an intuitive concept, but car bombs really do devastate. Uh, much more so than mortars or even airdrop bombs, um, contrary to the, maybe some of the reports coming out of Syria, even though they cause equal devastation um, or, or terrible devastation. Um, you were looking at 63% of all casualties recorded in our survey were by um, car bombs um, and 25% uh, coming from air launch weapons. So, they're, they're, I'm sorry, 25% from ground launch weapons. Um, in terms of a comparison, um, as Steve pointed out, it's, it's getting worse, and, and you know, that is reflected by a 26% rise in civilians killed and injured, um, again, led by countries like Syria um, and the, the, the burden there. We recorded um, 8,400, coming on to 8,400 civilian casualties in Syria alone, and that is a, a, a very, very conservative figure. I'm, I'm, I'm sure on a personal level that's probably... Um, uh, a third of the number, if not, if not less. I mean, it's, 
it, it's very hard to get the, the media reports that's really confirming um, numbers dead and to, to corroborate that. Um, Iraq is still um, very much up there, um, knocked off from the first place, so to speak, from 2011. Um, and it's interesting that in recent weeks as well, there's been a, a quite a surge of violence in Iraq. So um, in, in next year's report, we may show that Iraq um, has a similar dominant role. And um, you can see at the bottom there, whilst Pakistan and, and Afghanistan um, with drone attacks and other um, international interventions and, and national responses, um, they, they are still there. Um, the, the inclusion of Nigeria is an interesting development in the use of explosive weapons. And it'd be interesting to see um, next year whether um, the issues that are happening in Nigeria at the moment will boost that figure. Um, what sort of weapons types? Well, I've touched on them briefly, and air launch weapons, um, uh, they don't always hit um, populated areas. There's clearly some sort of doctrine within military command structures um, that you know, still balks at the idea of dropping um, a, a, an air load onto um, an urban area. Um, but it still has a big impact on civilians, and 88% of casualties in populated areas were civilians. So um, this idea of targeted weaponry from the air is, um, even with drones, I think is um, a myth that can be perpetuated. Um, ground launch explosive weapons are much more likely to be used in urban areas, we found, um, w coming up to 7,000 civilians killed um, all across the globe, um, about 93% of casualties reported in urban areas from this particular type of weapon, uh, ground launch weapon. And obviously, w w you can think of places like Homs as a, as, a, as a specific example of that sort of terror. Um, and improvised explosive devices, which um, is something which, on a personal level, I'm, I'm very interested in my both investigating and doing policy work at AOAV to really try and e examine how do you engage with non-state actors. Because um, IEDs are a major, major problem in terms of the, the, the bringing of death. 17,000 civilian killed. And you look at 91% of casualties in populated areas are from IEDs. So um, it's a very um, blunt weapon. Um, um, and possibly used because it causes so many um, um, innocent lives to be taken. Um, I'm going to only briefly touch on Syria before I hand over, but um, uh, I think it's, it's interesting to look at the, the hardest hit provinces and to sort of um, identify how they can differ from an analysis. Um, Homs, for instance, you can see that, um, that that very big red line there identifies um, uh, land-launched we explosive weapons, uh, ground-launched explosive weapons, which shows that there's clearly some sort of state acting going on there with 93% of civilian casualties out of Homs um, from a consequence of that weapon use. Whereas in Damascus, the predominant uh, weapon use seems to be IEDs and car bombs. So you, you, you can see almost the, the, the different approaches and the different uh, um, zones of conflicts occurring just in terms of, of, of the, the outcome. And I think this, this, this map, for me, um, really extols the benefits of um, the collaborations of national reporting and um, civilian casualty reporting that we see. Because you can actually, um, from an overview, take um, actual ground uh, understanding of, of what is happening in terms of military strategy and counter-response. So I'm now going to um, we'll, we'll keep this in a holding pattern, but I'm now, now going to hand over to Human Rights Watch. Thanks very much. Um, I'm sort of the sideshow here to this really important report that, uh, that AOAV has put out that should really drive home to all of us, I guess, the importance of this initiative uh, that, that uh, Norway has undertaken and the importance of following through on this initiative, the need to offer greater protection to civilians in the future, and particularly uh, to deal urgently with the issue of the use of explosive weapons in populated areas. Uh, Human Rights Watch put out a report uh, last month called Death from the Skies that focuses on airstrikes on civilians in Syria. It's focusing on airstrikes not because they're the only problem in Syria, as you can see from the information that's just been put up there. Indeed, ground launched weapons have been a huge problem as well. For this report, we focused uh, on the locations where airstrikes have caused some of the greatest problems uh, and where they cause the most civilian casualties. 
this report also, I think, helps to point out that you do, in order to uh, get the best possible and most detailed possible information, need to try to put people on the ground. To get the big picture, you have to rely on the media and a wide range uh, of different sources, uh, as Sarah Holwinski pointed out in her presentation this morning. But ultimately, if you're going to be able to make determinations about violations of international humanitarian law and you're going to try to discover who's responsible for what, you need to be able to get uh, people on the ground. And we were able to do that in uh, a number of locations uh, in Syria, although access is limited in other places. We visited 50 sites in three different, three different governorates. Um, Aleppo and Idlib were the ones where the most damage was done, as well as Latakia. These are places where the air war was the most, uh, the most significant. I should point out when I say we visited, it wasn't me. Uh, truth in advertising, we had teams of, of people going in. Uh, I was not uh, among uh, those uh, in our teams. We interviewed 140 witnesses or victims uh, of the airstrikes in these 50 different sites. In addition, we were able to supplement the work with something that sort of really brand new. There, you've probably all seen the huge number of videos coming out uh, of Syria in a really kind of unprecedented situation where you can analyze the videos and learn a huge amount. We've combined expert analysis of the videos with satellite, <clears throat> satellite imagery and video frame analysis where we can actually, uh, without even being on the ground in some locations, identify precisely what's been hit, you know, just, not just the, the city but, or the neighborhood, but the precise location of what's been hit and to determine what it's been hit with uh, through very careful analysis of the videos and the satellite imagery. Um, a, a, a sort of a stunning development in our ability to gather information about, uh, about uh, what's been used and what damage it has caused. We identified 59 unlawful attacks that killed at least 152 civilians. Those unlawful attacks included 15 what we believe were deliberate attacks on civilians, <coughs> and then also 44 attacks that we uh, believe were indiscriminate in nature, and they're so, therefore also unlawful. Certainly the deliberate attacks constitute war crimes, where you have criminal intent, uh, and, and in all likelihood many of the indiscriminate attacks rise to the level of uh, war crimes as well, where the weapons that were used or how they were used um, gave you enough knowledge that they were going to be indiscriminate that you could, you could uh, make the case for criminal intent. We identified 152 civilians killed, many, many more injured. This, of course, is just a very small slice of the actual damage, uh, the actual civilian casualties. These are the ones that we were uh, able to get the names and the exact uh, details of, um, uh, of the deaths. Uh, others have cited figures of more than 4,000 civilian casualties uh, since July 12. And, and of course, if you count not just uh, direct deaths, but others, you can get up to numbers of tens of thousands of civilians. And it's not, of course, just the casualties that we documented, but huge physical destruction, infrastructure uh, destruction as well. And I think we're all probably very well aware of the displacement, the refugee flows that have taken place uh, from uh, these airstrikes and other attacks as well. And it was also very striking to us just the incredible psychological impact um, of these uh, attacks, air attacks on civilians, uh, mostly in populated, uh, heavily populated air areas, where it was clear that people were simply living in terror of what uh, the country's air force might be doing to them. We identified the deliberate targeting of civilians um, 
in, both, at, in, in the cases of both bakeries, where they were attacking civilians in line with no other military target anywhere in the area, and this wasn't just once, but um, eight different times uh, with four different bakeries, and then also hospitals, which of course are protected uh, under international humanitarian law. At least two hospitals hit uh, repeatedly, a total of seven times uh, as well. These, again, amount to war crimes. There was, in, in all of these unlawful attacks, in most cases, there was no military target that was evident. Um, that we could identify anywhere nearby or that the civilians we interviewed could identify anywhere nearby. In the cases where there was uh, a potential military target, we were struck at how rare uh, there was damage to the military target, damage to a headquarters or any other military structure nearby. And we could not confirm a single instance of a military casualty from these airstrikes. So this gives you uh, a very, very strong impression of a campaign that is simply aimed at both creating terror and in uh, uh, and causing deliberate harm to civilians. It seemed that over the course uh, of the, the war since mid-2012, the Syrian government has just resorted to sort of worse and worse uh, means and methods of warfare as they've gone along. Uh, they used landmines, prohibited landmines, uh, fairly early in the conflict. Shortly after that, they started dropping prohibited cluster bombs uh, in populated areas. Then they went to ground launch, cluster munitions in populated areas. They moved on to use of incendiary weapons uh, in populated areas, which is also prohibited by international law. There's not a comprehensive prohibition on incendiary weapons like there is with anti-personnel mines and cluster munitions, but there is a prohibition on use uh, of air-delivered incendiary weapons in populated areas, which is what we saw in, uh, in Syria, have seen in Syria. Um, but most of the damage really was caused by large, high-explosive, unguided bombs. Um, rather than the cluster munitions or the incendiary weapons. Dropping 250 kilogram bombs uh, in populated areas, bombs that are capable of destroying multiple houses uh, with, with each weapon used. And eventually they resorted to the use of ballistic missiles, uh, generically called SCUDs, although most of these that we identified were not actually SCUDs um, as well. We have identified more than 120 different uh, locations where cluster munitions have been used. Uh, some of those locations were hit repeatedly. Uh, well more than 150 cluster bombs uh, have been used. We identified the use of incendiary weapons in at least five different locations. So these are not isolated incidents of use of these weapons that most of the rest of the world has prohibited. Um, let me just, just stop by saying that you know, our hope is that uh, a report like this, and indeed a report like the one put out by AOAV, will help to stop not just, uh, you know, help to, to curtail not just deliberate and indiscriminate uh, attacks, airstrikes and other attacks, but that it will also uh, help to bring the international community to the point of curtailing the use of explosive weapons in populated areas and stopping altogether the use of explosive weapons with wide area effects in populated areas. And we hope that those are some key things that come out of this conference and this process as well. Thank you. Steve, thanks very much. Serena, over to you, please. Thank you. So I think I'll... I'll would like to focus a bit on, on the issue of the documentation. And I think it was stressed quite strongly this morning by the Foreign Minister um, of Norway how important documentation is to, to build the evidence, really, of what is happening in a conflict and also afterwards to, to be able to, to hold accountable for, for what has been happening. Um, 
I think there, there are a number of, of points where casualty recording and, and documenting um, the conflict is, is really key. Um, one of them is, um, as we have heard, enhancing compliance with, with international humanitarian law. And it's obviously, um, without the evidence, it's very difficult to assess um, principles of, of distinction or, or proportionality, um, precaution me measures. But it's also key, um, as, as we have heard from Steve just now, to, to assess what type of weapons are actually used during a conflict. Is there a violation there to, to what already exists? Or are there specific crimes like um, rape or sexual crime that are committing? This, this, is, this is all information that can come out if there is systematic, systematic da data gathering, um, if it's aimed at being comprehensive as well. Um, but, but obviously, it also helps um, to, to recognize patterns of harm. And I think what we have just heard is a, is, is a clear example on, on how that can be useful. Um, probably recognizing the patterns of harm that happen in different conflicts it's, it's particularly useful when, we, when you're trying at, at working towards avoiding, avoiding civilian casualties or, or at least minimizing it. And I think we have seen that quite clearly with, with the landmine, for, uh, landmine treaty and also the, the Convention on Cluster Munitions where, where really the, the medical data w was at the base of, of all the policy that has been developed afterwards. I think it was through, through medical data that, we, that it was shown that 90% of civilians were killed by or injured by, by landmines. Minds. So that is what has then moved um, an entire policy process forward, and that is why today we have probably a third, like according to the landmine monitor, around a third of the victims that that were before before the, the treaty entered into force. And and similar numbers are seen also with with the cluster munition convention, which is a lot earlier uh, stage, but also uh, numbers of victims have been re reduced quite quite strongly by that. Um, a third point that I think it's quite in interesting in, in terms of having the casualty recording is um, the way you can assess the, the protection mission, the, the, the efficiency of what is being done, but also the efficient efficiency of new policies that have been adopted, of actions that has been taken on the ground. Um, an interesting example here is how, for example, the, the UN mission in, in Afghanistan has moved from gathering information only on violations of, of IHL into looking at circumstances where civilians are killed. And that has then led, for example, for, to, to the IS, ISF to, to adopt their own casualty um, recording system. And also it has led to some changes in policies um, on, on use of airstrikes, for example, by, by ISF. So it has, it has some concrete impact on how um, missions engage, engage on, on the ground. One, one point that, that is also interesting, I think, is um, how it can really um, help in, in, in planning humanitarian responses um, and, and also ensuring um, more security for, for the humanitarian agencies when they are moving into, into conflict situations. Um, the picture we have actually seen just before is a casualty tracking system um, that, that looks at um, violent conflict and incidents of violent conflict that are caused by the Lord Resistance Army in Central Africa. And this is information that is gathered um, by through UN agencies, through local NGOs, and also through an early warning radio that, that um, signals incidents of, of conflict. And what is very interesting there is that this information then is also used by, by UN agencies to inform um, their, their humanitarian plans, where they are going to intervene, and how they can reach civilians that are particularly affected by, by the incidents. And I think that the final key point here to, to underline is really the accountability, the, the question of accountability. And we've seen in the past how, how information that has been gathered both during and after the conflict has informed, um, for example, um, reparation for victims in Bosnia, or it has been used by the International um, Tribunal, the International Tribunal in ex Yugoslavia to, um, um, to use it against uh, perpetrators of violence. The same has happened in Peru, for example, where it was used um, in the prosecution case against uh, the, the ex-president Fujimori. So it, there, is, there is quite a useful um, information there, but obviously in order to do that, it needs to happen. The information needs to be gathered both during the conflict and also afterwards, so it needs to 
be done systematically, and it needs to have a, a certain grade of disaggregation. So knowing why you are recording the information is, is, for, is probably the first key step into that. And, and just before closing, in terms of some short recommendations to countries that are actually here and what can be done, I think it's quite important. There will be a session tomorrow on, on recording casualties. We have heard some of it already this uh, today. And I think recognizing um, the value of casualty recording is something that should be done quite strongly and is something that is starting to happening, not yet where it should be. So calling for, for that is, is, a, is an important first step. Also acknowledge where the lack on casualty recording is at the moment and stress some of the places where it's happening and it's, and it's actually having an impact. So generate more information of how it can be done and, and where it has been done is, is something that would be really important. And for countries here really to, to commit to, um, to strengthen casualty recording um, in, it's, it's probably the key, the key element. And that will um, be something that is obviously quite tricky and, and, and we recognize the challenges in, in recording the casualties in conflict, but it, it's being done. There is, there is a, a research from the Oxford Research Group that looks at how practitioners in conflict situation have been recording casualties, and, and I think it's, it's really a matter of, of looking how, how states can really take that on as well. Serena, thanks very much. Well, let, let's wind it up now. And uh, from what Serena said, it, it's casualty reporting like that that has really underpinned the sort of figures that, that we've presented to you today. Um, and what can we conclude from it? Well, this ain't a problem that's going away. Um, our statistics show that this was pretty appalling, totally appalling, in 2011, even worse in 2012. And, of course, you might look at me and say, well, that's all very well, but of course you've got the blip on the radar, you've got Syria blipping up there, and it's not going to be the same again. Uh, it's going to be different next year. But of course it wasn't different when we had Iraq, it wasn't different when we had Afghanistan, it's not different now we've got Syria. What's going to be the next Syria tomorrow? This is a problem that just continues. Um, the use of explosive weapons in populated areas, manufactured weapons, you've seen the horrendous effects on, on civilians, but also of course the um, those weapons used by non-state actors, the over 60% of, of the figures coming from IEDs, and how, how do you tackle that as well? Um, both Action on Armed Violence and Human Rights Watch are members of the International Network on Explosive Weapons, and you would have seen Richard Moyes talking about um, uh, explosive weapons in populated areas on, on the stage this morning. Um, we fully commit to the call of, uh, of INU and uh, coming round to our recommendations from this, from, uh, from our report over 2012, is for states to acknowledge the unacceptable harm uh, caused by the use of explosive weapons in populated areas. To strive to avoid this harm by reviewing and strengthening national policies and practices. To work towards fulfilling the rights of victims of explosive violence. And to develop stronger international standards, including prohibitions and restrictions on the use of explosive force. There's a lot that can be done here. There's a lot that needs to be done here. And uh, we're quite happy. We don't have all the answers, obviously, but we're quite happy to discuss it further and take any questions now. Thank you.